today I will be talking about something that uh, is actually very near and dear to my heart because it's my uh, PhD project. Um, and I haven't talked about especially the production and the purification of KDPFABC uh, in a long time. And I want to start by saying, so while today we actually have uh, several of those, so very pretty structures of the whole KDPFABC complex. When I started this protein in 2014, the idea of the structure we had looked like this. Um, but before I want to tell you how I got from the left to the right side, uh, I actually want to tell you a little bit about the protein itself. So KDPFABC is exclusively uh, found in prokaryotic organisms and there it is expressed under potassium limiting conditions. So that means when the external potassium concentration falls below 100 micromolar, KDPFABC is expressed to actually secure the cell survival. It does so by taking up uh, potassium against a very steep gradient into the prokaryotic cell. This process is dependent on ATP hydrolysis and hence KDPFABC is the primary reactive transporter. Uh, KDPFABC as a whole consists of four different subunits. And the first one you already know now, and actually I already stuck to the color scheme. So you already saw that in Joe's presentation, this is a P-type ATPase. Has the four classical domains, so the transmembrane domain, and then three cytoplasmic uh, and PNA domains. In KDPFABC, the P-type ATPase is paired with the potassium channel, which we can see here in green. Uh, this is a member of the superfamily of potassium transporters. It's fourfold pseudosymmetric and also has a central selectivity filter pool. Finally, there are the two smallest subunits, which are called KDPC and KDPF, which probably only play minor roles in the transport. So KDPF-ABC was uh, first discovered in the early 70s by Wolfgang Epstein, and since then it has been vigorously studied. So amongst other things, we know that it's highly specific for its substrate potassium. Also, the hydrolysis of ATP can only happen in the presence of potassium. And the other way around, transport of potassium can only happen if ATP is there for hydrolysis. Apart from that, also single amino acids that are crucial for ion selectivity, but also transport function have been identified for this complex. But the molecular mechanism by which KDPFABC actually transports ions was highly speculated about in the recent years. And only with the structures that we now have, uh, we are getting closer to having an idea of the mechanism. So uh, yeah, actually solving at that point still a crystal, crystal structure of KDPFABC was the prime goal of my PhD thesis to answer this question. And um, yeah, first I started with the production of the protein. So um, uh, when I began this, um, there was an expression system for KDPFABC that was based on the natural promoter, which was the bacterial two component system, KDPD and KDPE. This system is actually induced by potassium limitation, a state that E. coli cells had to be adapted to over several days. And then in the final culture, which was actually done in media that literally didn't contain any potassium, this state has to be closely monitored and then uh, adapted by additions of small amounts of potassium that were just enough to allow the protein to function, but not too much to actually stop protein production. As you can see, this is very tedious, so it took a very long time to do that. You had to monitor it very closely. And in the end, the yield that I got was not very uh, convincing. So that was only to an OD of one. So uh, yeah, the, basically the first thing that I did is was that I wanted to optimize uh, a new expression system for the whole complex. And um, for this, I turned to uh, FX cloning, which is actually a very nice uh, strategy if you want to generate several different constructs. Um, this was first published in 2011 by Eric uh, Gertzmann, Raimund Dutzler and actually contains a variety of different expression vectors that are uh, different in tag, uh, tag position. You can get them with different promoters and they also fit for different expression hosts. So if, if you're looking to start a project, it might be worth looking into that. Um, for me, I had to have uh, several decisions that I had to take actually. So I had to decide between a T7 and Arabinose promoter for the expression in E. coli. 
Uh, in this case, I actually favor the Arabinose promoter because um, this is a tunable system. So the amount of Arabinose you add for the induction actually correlates to the amount of protein that is expressed. While uh, the T7 promoter for me rather worked like an on and off switch. So as soon as there's some IPDG around, you will get a high protein expression, which actually in the case of KDPA FABC was not favorable because too much protein expressed meant that a very high amount of potassium was taken up into the cells and that actually ceased cell growth and most of the cells died. Um, so yeah, this was the decision for the Arbinos promoter. Then I had to decide between N and C terminal tagging of the protein in the, both cases with the HIS-10 tag. And uh, what is very funny here is actually both of them worked and um, then the N terminal tag because all four subunits are on a single operon, so the N-terminal tag would actually be here, which would mean tagged KDPF that is only three kilo Dalton in size, and it still worked to purify the whole protein. But as you don't really see three kilo Dalton on any normal SDS page, I decided to go with the C-terminal tag. That also worked and then also gave me the guarantee of the whole four subunits being expressed and also I could nicely see the 25 kilo Dalton of KDPC on any Western blot or SDS page. And then um, finally I did one more thing which was that I changed the induction uh, of uh, the uh, expression for the KDP FABC uh, gene to the late exponential growth phase. So only after the cells that actually reached ODs around 1.5 I induced with the arabinose and then only for one additional hour um, because again although i lost used only 0.002 of arabinose so close to nothing um, the cell still ceased growing uh, after induction but i had an expression system down i got nice uh, cell yields from that um, and uh, actually after membrane preparation the next thing that I had a closer look at was solubilization of the KDP FABC complex. And um, before I started, the, the common detergent that was used in like 95% of all publications was called amine oxide WS35, uh, which is an industrial scale detergent that came in this nice and handy five liter uh, canister that is still there in the lab. Um, yeah, and was just very tedious to work with, actually never gave any structural results. So it was clear that this mix of different detergents had to be exchanged for a single defined detergent. So I actually performed a large scale uh, detergent screen. So I tested 70 different or around 70 detergents for their um, uh, effectiveness in solubilizing KDPF ABC. Um, so what I did is that I prepared membranes at 10 mix per mil, um, had uh, small fractions of that, added 1% of all the detergents overnight, uh, did a spin and then uh, yeah, put the supernatant on the western blot, always comparing to the uh, membranes that I um, used for all of this. And uh, as you can see, several of the detergents actually worked nicely for KDPFABC, which was pretty surprising for us at that time point because as said, this aminoxid was said to be the holy grail in the case of KDP. Um, yeah, then to, to further evaluate this and actually check uh, for the functionality of KDP FABC in different detergents, I used an ATP-8 assay. So you just check how much ATP is hydrolyzed over a certain amount of time. Um, and as you can see, um, I mean, it's just an example of some of them and uh, actually most of them also retained nice uh, activity, of course, uh, phoscoline 12 kind of as a negative control here. Um, but um, yeah, as you can see, some of them worked. And um, in the end, I actually decided for DDM. So a lot of screening um, to end up with uh, solubilization in DDM in the case of KDPFABC. And um, yeah, I went forward with that. And um, yeah, actually then I spent uh, another good amount of time on um, uh, yeah, the purification of KDP FABC after solubilization, because also there, um, there was uh, yeah, not, that much, not that much published at the time. And I ended up with a, a three-step purification strategy. So um, what I did is I bound solubilized protein to a uh, nickel cephalose resin, um, and then uh, eluted by a 3C protease cleavage. So I actually have a 3C cleavage site in between the his tag and the protein. 
And um, you can see the illusion here. So that is already quite um, pure. And one nice thing is that because the 3C protease itself is actually histect, it remains bound to the column. So I actually added two CV of buffer and the protease directly to the beads, just had that steering for a certain amount of time and eluted only the protein and not the uh, protease that stayed on the beast, as you can see here in this imidazole elution. Uh, the next step was an ion exchange chromatography um, to remove uh, additional contaminants. Um, actually, so the uh, isoelectric point of KDPF-ABC is around 7.5, so I decided to do that at pH 8. Uh, with an anion exchanger, so a positively charged uh, resin, that's a Q-surf arose, for example, um, I eluted with a um, sodium chloride gradient between 10 and then 500 millimolar. And as you can see, I nicely separate the protein, which is here, from uh, all contaminants that are high into 60 absorbents that uh, otherwise would be very hard to uh, get rid of. Um, yeah, then the final step was a gel filtration uh, for buffer exchange. So to get rid of the high of, of the uh, salt concentration at this point, so which was also quite high. So around 300 millimolar um, and uh, yeah, to go for final buffers for crystallization. And uh, yeah, this is the result. Um, this is the, the SDS page that comes with it. Again, KDPF is not visible to its small size, uh, but it's there. Um, and yeah, I guess we can all agree that uh, this is a, a very nice peak, but unfortunately, um, I tried to crystallize this for, I would say, better part of my PhD, and I never got anything. So that is the most frustrating uh, stretch that I had. And um, actually, uh, then a few years in, a crystal structure of KDPFABC was published uh, by, uh, by Björn and David, and um, I would have never gotten the trick that they used. So actually, this is the buffer composition uh, they used for gel filtration. So 1.1% of beta OG and then uh, 0.5 mix per mil of DMPC. So actually, they're adding a lot of lipid to that. But uh, once I had that protocol, I was actually reproduce, able to reproduce the results and also got some crystals that diffracted to between 3.5 and 4 angstrom at that point. So uh, that actually worked for me too, which is quite nice. But uh, luckily, in, in around 2018, uh, I got another uh, chance at this, actually, uh, in cryoEM, because we were approached by uh, Christina Paulino and her people, and we actually were able to put this on a cryoEM grid. And this uh, didn't take a lot of tries, actually, because the sample was just perfect, I guess, uh, for cryoEM analysis. So this was... Uh, in two to three trials, we had our first glimpses of what it looked like. Um, yeah, and if you actually want to know how it turned out and what, what the mechanism was that, that we proposed in this first, or with these first cryoEM structures of KDPF ABC, you can have a look at this uh, 2018 paper, um, which we published at that time. Um, yeah, then uh, I would also like to mention the first crystal structure that I already had two slides before which already revealed some of the uh, mysteries of KDPFABC. And then finally, I want to point to this uh, preprint, which was just uh, published or not published, but uh, out there last week uh, by Jacob, who is now leading the KDPFABC project, who together with Robin and Lisa had a very close look at how the ion transport mechanism actually works down to single amino acids. Uh, and this is totally worth a read, I would say. And uh, with this, I'm already at the acknowledgements. Um, so uh, yeah, this is work, or well, my PhD work largely uh, done in the group of Inga Hinnelt at the Goethe University in Frankfurt. Already mentioned Jacob. And then there's also Egon Dora, two postdocs in the lab who were also involved in the project. Uh, yeah, Christina and Lisa, who we did the cryoEM with at the University of Groningen. And then also Phil and Robin, who do some MD simulations on the project. And I also have to thank my new home. So this is here in the lab of Pornison, uh, where I now actually switched to a mammalian expression system. So something very new for me and also very exciting. And uh, they've given me a great new home. And I want to thank them and the old gang and uh, also all of you for your attention. And I'm open for questions now or also later down here. Thank you so much. Thank you, Charles, for that very nice story, right? Super nice uh, uh, 
a sick peak you had on that sample. So it <laughs> looked perfect for crystallization, <laughs> right? <laughs> we have a, a few questions. Um, Julie Tucker wants to say this. Well done for preserving Charlotte. Uh, Persevering, Charlotte, sorry. <laughs> Interesting to see that the SEC profile for the KDPF ABC that crystallized looks less monodispersed than the one did not. Any comments? I actually think it's the lipids. Um, I mean, I think that like the specific mix of OG and DMPC, that is already close to what you would use for like bicell crystallization. So DMPC is used a lot on that. And this is also why the peak doesn't look that or less sharp, I would say, because of the lipids. But I, I think it just might do the trick that it's like in a state between a bicell and something else that works for crystallization. Yeah, I mean, David Drew was kind of into that uh, as well. So today, earlier today. So yeah, I, I get also the feeling. Um, one question I had uh, was actually, how, mu how much yield did you get? Oh, um, actually, not super lot for bacterial protein expressed in E. coli. So for 12 liters, I got like half a milligram of protein. Yeah. 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 But still, you could work with it, right? Yeah, I mean, yeah. it was enough for, for, I mean, I did a lot of very big ex expressions during my PhD for presentation, <laughs> of course. But then once Cravium worked, that was uh, very nice. Yeah. So if you would start all over, what would you do? Would you... Um... Uh, start with cryoem from start or go both ways? I think again, the yields are, the, are what is very uh, determining for that, right? I mean, cryoem, you can do that with such little nowadays. And for crystallography, if you want to go big and then even for LCP or something like that, you need so much uh, material that yeah, it all depends on, on what you get out, I would say. Okay. So with that, I want to thank Charlotte and all the speakers for today.